What's up, beautiful people? Thanks for joining another episode of Dope People. Uh, I'm your host, Jacoby Holland. I will be joined by my colleagues, Peter and Lulu, per usual. And today, we're talking very New York cannabis. So our, our friend here, Alan, he's been a friend of the show, actually, for a little bit. Alan Gandelman, uh, former high school social studies teacher, turned organic vegetable farmer, and is now the founder and president of New York Cannabis Growers and Processors Association. This man, we've been talking to him a lot over the past few weeks. He doesn't sleep. He's been making things happen in New York. And I'm very, very excited to, to talk to him on the show and, and give you guys a little taste of what he's been doing. Thank you for joining. What up, Rebel fam? We in the building. We have a dope episode for you here today. As Jacoby said, Alan Gandelman's in the house. But first, as always, and usual, let's check in with our wonderful co-host, Lulu. How you doing? Hey, guys. Doing well. Um, hey. Excited to be coming back to New York. So um, you guys get me for a whole month. Hey. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I mean, even this episode, we're taking it back to New York. We we went all the way to Hawaii last time, Amen. just travel traveling the cannabis, the U.S. cannabis world. Yeah, and we've been so you know we're usually New York City centric, so we're going upstate today. Um, really stoked to uh, have our friend Alan um, partake with us today. So let's let's bring him on. Hey, Alan. Hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> what's up, man? How you doing? Doing good, doing good. Glad to be here and uh, so happy to be talking to you. Uh, I, I think I noticed this earlier, but this is the first time in like the four or five times I've talked to you in the last month that you weren't like in a field or bustling <laughs> between meetings. Like you're actually stationary at a computer. <laughs> it's kind of weird. That's special just for this interview, but yeah, usually yeah. I would be somewhere outside, but I figured that would be a tough one to do. <laughs> hey, we appreciate it. Making the time and the space. We're here for it. Um, all right. So I kind of alluded to this. Uh, you have been the man out here in New York. And I, I say that genuinely because I, I, I do, because I see the work that you're doing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of talk. A lot of people talk. But I see you actually walking out here, and I appreciate it. Um, so I want to I want to break it down first of all how you even got into this position of like where you are in this New York world, this ecosystem, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about actually what's going on in New York, the status of um, this MRTA bill that's coming through, some of the um, the existing hemp farmers, and like what they're going through. So. Let's get into it. Uh, you started as a social studies teacher. Interesting. Uh, how long were you doing that? Tell me about it. Yeah, I was a high school social studies teacher. I was teaching at a uh, school here, mostly at risk youth. We had 80% people, 80% uh, of my students were like free and reduced lunch. So a lot of them like were only eating when they came to school, breakfast and lunch, you know, their families couldn't necessarily afford a lot of food at home. And what was happening is the school food, I mean, this is almost 15 years ago. Uh, I doubt anything has changed, but the school food was so bad. My students were having a really hard time learning, right? And so I just got into food and nutrition and I got into farming and local agriculture. And I just felt at that point in my life that I could make more of an impact on the world if I just like quit teaching uh, and became a farmer. And then like with the mission of growing organic vegetables and then selling them to school districts for their cafeterias and providing like nutritional education and education to the school, uh, to the school districts on how to actually use vegetables, uh, in their meals. So, okay. yeah. So, very fascinating, complete like 180 on career change here, but I want to break down. You said that the food was so bad that it affected the way that students were learning. How do you know that? Like, what did you see that made you so confident of that? Yeah, so I don't know if you've ever like drank too much coffee or eaten too much sugar and then just had a straight up sugar crash. 
Um, but I'm sure most people know what that feels like. And when you watch like a ninth grader eat like four cinnamon toast crunch candy bars for breakfast, get all hyped up in like first period, second period, and then like start falling asleep, like, you know, halfway through the day, you're like, man, this kid is on a sugar crash, drank, a, also drank a two liter of, of Mountain Dew. And now obviously they can't learn because they're just like floored of, you know, their sugar crash. So you know, I was just seeing a lot of that. And, um, you know, that's really what motivated me to just start farming. And I'd like to say people always assume I'm like a farmer and have this like farm family and farm background. I'm originally from Queens and New Jersey, and uh, I did not grow up on a farm anywhere near a farm. And so it was like a huge, like life transition slash career change. Um, so for all the people out there that think they can't get into farming because they didn't grow up on a farm, uh, that's not necessarily true. Okay. The city, the city <laughs> kid at, at heart, but you also had kind of like a, a revolutionary, revolutionary trip, um, vacation or, or place that you went, not, um, acid trip, <laughs> maybe an acid trip. I don't know. A lot uh, of you those, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, what, what happened there that kind of like helped change that mindset for you? Yeah. So I quit teaching and I spent a year in India, um, mm. traveling around India, going to the, uh, you know, Himalayas, doing hiking, uh, volunteering, teaching English to Tibetan refugees. And, um, you know, just definitely solidified my idea that I just wanted to do something that would give back to the world and, you know, give back to society. And to me, food and farming was the way I was going to do that. Got it. Got it. Okay. I mean, a whole year in India, like you had to learn a little bit more than like, I want to go into food and farming. Like, what, what else did you learn that maybe isn't, doesn't have to do with, with food? You, you know, I read a lot of books, did a lot of meditation, did a lot of yoga, uh, definitely just got my mind right uh, and got grounded and made sure that like the next chapter of my life would be really intentional and I would be very focused on doing what I wanted to do and just like living out what I really wanted to live out and not other people's, you know, expectations of what I was supposed to do as kind of part of this crazy, you know, capitalist society that we all are fucking stuck in whether we yeah. like it or not <laughs> totally, totally there's no escaping it you can hate it or love it but you're part of it you gotta be <laughs> that is uh, true <laughs> all right so you're fresh off the plane from india you, you you just come to the u.s like what are the first like 30 60 days like are, are you hitting the ground running you you have clarity of what you want to do or is it like hey i just want to do something meaningful and you figured out exactly what that was while you were here. I was I was clear. I started as soon as I got back, I came back upstate, you know, and I was like, I'm going to look for farmland and just start farming and taking farm classes and just, you know, move forward with the plan. And uh, I happened to find an old abandoned flower nursery and it had like a few greenhouses on it. And it was in the same happened to be in the same town where I was uh, teaching in upstate here in Cortland. Uh, you know, outside Ithaca. And uh, so, yeah, I just bought that place. They were asking a lot of money for it. I wrote the family who was selling it in a, a letter with like a really low offer. And I was like, I know you guys, you know, want X amount of money for this place, but this is all I could afford. And this is what I'm going to do with the place uh, and bring it back to life. And they agreed and they sold it to me for like 40% lower than their asking price and so which was amazing uh yeah. and i and i and i got the greenhouses and i fixed the place up and you know um my friend and my girlfriend moved into the house with me and we just started growing food and basically what was our backyard and we built that farm out we built out the greenhouses we built out an aquaponic system and as the, and that was 10 11 years ago now and as that business were, was growing we just we needed to expand and you know now uh, we moved from that farm about 6 years ago and are now on a 200 acre beautiful farm bunch of greenhouses big beautiful red barns very picturesque and uh, growing a lot of vegetables uh, a lot of which make their way into new york city uh, restaurant chains down there like Sweet Green and Dig, uh, 
Uh, and then a lot of vegetables that are going to, we have like a low income uh, food box CSA program that we supply. We supply a lot of food pantries in the county. We have 21 food pantries here. So, you know, still doing a lot of the food access work and selling at farmers markets. Um, and so luckily, you know, we grew that business slowly over the years into, you know, what it is now. Okay. This is so dope. All right. I don't even want to talk about weed stuff for a minute here. <laughs> like what's a farm class? Like how, how does one learn to farm yeah. at scale? Like I know how to grow tomatoes, like one tomato plant. Right. But like, how do you, how do you learn that? And it's just the three of you small scale, like how big are we talking here? Like, I want to know what that, those first couple of days were like that first harvest. Yeah. I mean, it was a big learning experience. You know, luckily we're really close to Ithaca and Ithaca has an amazing small farm scene. Cornell is here. Um, so there's a lot of good resources, resources for small and beginning farmers. And so we took advantage of all those resources. And one of the programs that I found myself in here in Ithaca was called uh, ground, it was called the Groundswell Center for Local Food and Farming. And it was a year long intensive incubator uh, that I went through where we would do classes at night. And during the days, we would go to work on other farms and learn from all the different farms in the area, the small scale, diversified fruit, vegetable, animals, you know, the whole thing. And so that year of learning, you know, was my foundation to farming. And I made a lot of great farming friends and resources. Um, and I also learned firsthand what it's like to go through a farm incubator program, mm -hmm. which I think would be will be very relevant once we get into our cannabis talks in New York and small farms and craft growers. But, you know, I experienced that firsthand. And, you know, without that program, there's no way we would have stayed in business. I mean, we even had like business planning classes for small farms. It was truly a gift and an amazing thing to just like come back from india and then all of a sudden this program start up and be like all right we're accepting like the first class of uh the sustainable farming program and i was just like you know count me boom. in let's let's go boom uh, i forget what the quote is exactly but uh from the alchemist when you when you really want something and the universe knows it the universe conspires for you and i feel like that's exactly what you're saying like you you that intention just manifested those vibes. <laughs> and then you, and then you beat me to the punch. I was going to, I was going to bring up, Sorry. I, no, it's good. I, I was going to bring up this incubator program. And like, you probably thought you're going to go learn how to farm, but really you got a whole bunch of new friends. You got a whole bunch of people that you probably work with and learn things from still today. That network grows. You have mentors, you have like, you know, you go for one thing and you realize that you needed something else even more. And when New York is talking about how they're going to do this cannabis rollout, mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk about incubation and stuff. There's no plan yet. Uh, I'm excited to see what happens. But like, what a model. Obviously, something worked there, right? Yes, totally. It was an amazing model. Um, it doesn't exist anymore today, that program specifically. It, it morphed a little bit over the years because it was all funded by the USDA. So depending on funding changes, it turned into like a... Uh, an incubator farm for new American farmers. So then I got to start working with new American farmers, you know, immigrants, they might have not sp spoken English and, you know, seeing how they got into farming on these like quarter acre plots, which also was really important to me because what I didn't mention is that, you know, I'm a first generation American. I'm the first person in my family born in the United States. English is not my first language. Um, I didn't learn English till I went to school in Queens to elementary school. So like, um, you know, I totally resonated also with that program of helping, you know, people get started and their choice if they wanted to be farmers as new Americans. And so that was also a really nice transition to see how you, you incubate those businesses of, uh, you know, people that might not have all of the, you know, baseline knowledge of like American culture or like business understanding or, you know, literacy issues, right? You might not be able to fully be totally literate. Like luckily for me, I had went to college and, you know, I have a master's degree. So business planning was a little bit easier for me. But if you're a new American and you don't have great English skills, uh, that is a big challenge. I mean, I, I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but there's so many parallels to the the cannabis realm that's going to grow inside of New York there's plenty of people that got the skills. People know how to grow. They know how to like make different products. They already have distribution networks. 
there's probably, and I, I'm kind of projecting here, but there's probably like a couple, a handful of skills that they don't quite have yet. Mm-hmm. Where if, if we can provide some of that, um, just like a, an olive branch to connect some of those dots, the analogy there being like English or, <laughs> you know, whatever, yeah. whatever it is, right? Like it could be just having a lawyer that can speak the legalese for you. I like that's going to be so, so important out here. And one thing that I love is, um, the community you're talking about is a lot less competitive than it is cooperative. Right. And so when we we were opening up these cannabis markets, if you look at big business, we were talking about this off screen, like Florida, that shit's competitive, right? That's just really competitive to get the license. And then if you have the the license, you're like, you're fighting with everybody else for, for what you can get. And that, that small kind of like ecosystem of a bunch of small businesses, you guys are in this together. And I, I feel like people don't understand that that's how these little microcosms operate. And, and I think you and I share the fact that that's how we want the New York market to look. Yeah, that's a great point, Jacoby. And like, I'm going to give you just a real life example of how we cooperate up here in our farming community. When we first landed this account for Sweet Green, which, you know, you might know, it's like a pretty big restaurant chain, right? So we grow, we grow carrots for every single Sweet Green in New York City for like six months out of the year. And my farm at that time was a lot smaller and we didn't have the capacity just to, to meet the contract. And it's a big, it's a big contract. Sweet Green goes through a lot of carrots. And I called one of my old farmer mentors outside Ithaca and I said, hey, listen, like I'm landing this carrot contract. I can't fulfill it. Do you, will you do half of this contract for me? And we'll do this one together. We'll, we'll supply half and half. We'll get paid the same price. Like we'll just ship it all down to New York City together. You know, and we did. We did that for a couple of years until I could like scale my business to a point where we were big enough and had enough employees to to meet that contract. But we up here do have that very cooperative uh, mindset, at least in the vegetable community. And I really hope we carry that into the, the cannabis community and that like, we're all in this together. And if like, one of us is succeeding, it's because all of us are succeeding. It's not one person or the other person, right? It's not a zero sum game like that. And so I think that's a mentality that our com- cannabis community could bring to these regulations, to the licensing, to the to the entire structure of New York State Versus like you mentioned that Florida model of like, I'm going to build a million square feet, fuck everyone else. I hope you all go out of business, you know, and uh, very different mentality here in New York. Well, uh, only time will tell, but I know you're, you're doing your best to try to advocate for that. So before we go too far down the cannabis route, uh, why in the world did you start using some of your land to grow hemp? So this must have been, I don't know, six, seven years. You kind of had some some flow with the farming now. You got a decent business and you decided to to repurpose or purpose some land you weren't using to hemp. Talk talk to me about that. Mm-hmm. So I got really sick with Lyme disease in 2016. Um, I was like really sick, chronic pain, couldn't get out of bed, like could barely lift my cell phone some days, you know, it was so bad. And uh you know, I've been a cannabis user my entire life. I took a break after, you know, uh, spending a lot of time in India and getting into meditation and yoga, you know, you start like cleaning up your lifestyle a little bit. So I took a cannabis break. uh, And I was super sick with Lyme. And, you know, one of the first things I did was go back to THC. And for my symptoms. And at the time I was making uh, Rick Simpson oil, you know, in my kitchen, old school with the rice cooker, like, dangerous way and uh (laughs) you know it was helping my symptoms right but i was taking like now that i look back and i do lab testing for products i you know i was probably taking 100 200 milligram doses at a time and i was like yeah man i was like super high but that's kind of what you have to do when you're treating that level of like chronic pain and uh, I couldn't work either because I was so high. You know, I have a bunch of 20 employees and driving like tractors and it's just not safe at that at that level. And so that's when I discovered CBD 2017. And I started switching from high doses of THC during the day to C- high doses of CBD during the day. 
And I was buying it all from Colorado, from friends of mine in the cannabis industry out there. And uh, man, within two, three months, most of my Lyme symptoms were gone. And of course, you know, go back to that alchemist, which I love that book. But right at that time, New York legalized industrial hemp. And I called the state and I was like, can I grow hemp and make CBD out of it? And they were like, what is CBD? And they're like, is it from hemp? I was like, yeah, it's from hemp. And they're like, sure, go ahead. You can do that. And I, I have license number five, like literally one of the first licenses in the state to grow hemp and process it for CBD. And so um, that's how we got into it. And we have the farmland, the greenhouses, a commercial kitchen. So we were able to just start doing it and scaling that business. Okay. But you didn't have any experience growing cannabis or hemp at this point what, what was the learning curve like how did you train up on on growing a new plant i traveled around the country for like a year sourcing good genetics got lucky uh ended up in oregon at some point uh with the crawford brothers from oregon cbd i was their first new york grower uh for all their genetics and uh you know luckily growing like like hemp for cbd outdoor is very similar to growing tomatoes and you know you need all the equipment you need all the people and so i mean obviously my staff is familiar with growing cannabis we live in upstate new york so it wasn't like super far into any of us and you know that first year i think we grew 10 acres of feminized seed for cbd and um, you know, luckily we have big infrastructure, big buildings, warehouses, drying space. And so, uh, there was a learning curve, of course, a lot of mistakes, still making a lot of mistakes, but we were positioned with the infrastructure and the employee base to really do it like well from day one. Okay. So talk to me about actually how you sold it, right? Just because you're a good farmer doesn't mean that you can find the market for people to buy your products. And so first how, how you would market it and sell your, your hemp products, but, or, or CBD, and then how that differs from whatever you were doing in the vegetable game. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in the vegetable game, we were growing carrots and selling them. But what we were also doing is processing carrots and beets for school districts. We were pre-chopping vegetables in our commercial kitchen and packaging them in these like 10 pound bags. So when we sent them to a school cafeteria, all they had to do was dump them on a tray and bake them. So we were already doing some of that processing and we had realized early on that that value added was huge because vegetables otherwise are just a commodity. And so when I got into hemp and CBD, the first thing I knew is like, all right, I got to learn how to do extraction and manufacturing. And, you know, I've seen facilities in Colorado doing THC just from, you know, my friends being in the industry. And so I said, we're going to build a processing facility and we're going to come out with our own brand and we're going to make our own, you know, hemp CBD lines. But we're also going to work with other small farmers, bring their hemp in here and make their CBD lines for them too, if they want. And so that was our business model from day one. And right now on the hemp side, we have two brands that uh, we make for CBD products. One is called Head and Heel. You know, that brand is crushing it. We're sold in every single Wegmans in New York State, tons of pharmacies, uh, e-commerce, um, et cetera. That's all like the tinctures and topicals. And then our other brand is just hemp flower that is called florist farms and that's mostly um, e-commerce uh, sales. So that's how we were able to kind of ride that wave is doing direct to consumer and wholesale with our own, our own brands. Um, and then also, you know, toll processing and being a contract manufacturer for, for other companies as well. Um, I want to come back to the contract manufacturing, but I, I know that you kind of got a lucky break with this Wegmans thing. Like how, how did you, how the hell did you pull that off? So uh, we, we were selling vegetables at farmer's markets and we were bringing our head and heel CBD product to farmer's markets. And it was like outpacing all the vegetable sales. I mean, it was doing really well at the time. And my business partner, Carly and I joined a business incubator at Cornell because we're not far from Cornell. And 
part of the business incubator. Here's where these incubators come back in, right? Uh, double incubator for me, I guess. So part of the uh, incubator was that we have to pitch our business to like the group and the public, you know, and they brought in, you know, 50 people, 100 people and all the little businesses at the business incubator. So I'm not so little are pitching that night. And Carly and I just pitched our CBD products. We pitched head and heel and we talked about it and what, you know, what makes us amazing and farmer grown, certified organic, you know, full spectrum, all the good stuff. And that night in the audience just happened to be the Wegmans buyer and uh, called us up like the next day and said, hey, we want to bring CBD into Wegmans. We don't have it yet, but we want to bring you guys in as one of the first brands. Uh, you know, can you come out to Rochester for a meeting? That's where their headquarters are. And we were like, sure, let's go. You know, at that time we were so little, we didn't have like sales sheets. We didn't have like photography. We had like nothing. And we sold into Wegmans just two SKUs or two tinctures, a 600 milligram tincture, 1200 milligram tincture, no boxes, just the tincture bottle. So like we had like this tiny little shelf space and then, you know, you got Charlotte's web and you've got all the big brands. And from day one, and still to this day, we have been the top selling CBD company at Wegmans uh, across all Wegmans from day one till now. So we're their number one selling CBD brand in the ingestible category, which I think is crazy. And we pulled that off with two SKUs. And I think just the, we got super lucky and the price point was good. We weren't, we didn't want to overcharge because I know how much I was spending on cannabis medicine when I was taking it for Lyme disease and I was taking like heroic freaking doses and I wanted to make sure that people could afford it. And so we were retailing products, our organic full spectrum CBD for almost half of what Charlotte's web was selling for. And cause it wasn't about the money. It never was, you know, hopefully it never will be, but it was just really simply about getting it to as many people as possible. And so we just, did that what we believed in and and then yeah we hit really nice sales <laughs> milestones and and got a lot of recognition and from those two SKUs you know we've building out the brand ever since to like I don't know 20 SKUs topicals all different tinctures pet line um and so yeah it's been a wild ride in that in this last few years on that dude that's dope that's cool <laughs> I'm, ha I'm happy to hear it man um it's it's just great for the brand. It's great to see you. and it's it's it sounds sounds like it's because you were or are a patient and you could empathize and you created a product for people, not a product for profit. And ultimately, all the decisions that stem from that mindset have have really kind of led to the success of that venture. I want to talk about um, the contract manufacturing because that's pretty interesting. We actually just talked to. Um, a group in California a couple episodes ago where they don't own a license. They own the branding, marketing, and the SOPs, and they work with people that manufacture for them. So I want to understand that business for you, both on hemp. We could touch in cannabis too, if you think it's interesting. But like, how do you find people you want to manufacture for? How do you find like what the right quantities are that fit for you that don't maybe cannibalize the existing businesses that you're already working through? Yeah. Those are all really good questions. Uh, we've made some very conscious decisions on those fronts. I guess the first one is people find us, honestly, because they find head and heel and they call us and they're like, I love your products. They're really good, organic, full spectrum, New York made. I want that too. You know, like people from New York City or around the state, Long Island, wherever. So a lot of those people find us and what we've and we work with farmers as well. And I know from being a small farmer, you don't just have like crazy capital to invest in inventory. Like that's so difficult. And so what we do for the smaller brands is we offer no minimums, like white label service. So any product that we make for head and heel, we will put your sticker on it for your brand. We'll put it in a box if you want and uh, send it to you. And you could do your own sales or distribution or if you're just doing e-commerce, we'll even do your fulfillment for you. So we have brands that come to us, you know, they might live in the city. They don't want to like hold inventory. And so we literally do the entire thing for them. They get, they build a website, we hook it into our, you know, backend shipping program and we just do it all for them. So we really are trying to work with people at any scale, at any size. And there's people who will order like two cases at a time from us 
with their own brand on it and just sell it at their local farmer's market or their local stores or whatever they're doing. Um, and we're super happy to support those people because like, you know, I said, I started small with no money and, you know, I want to pay that forward. And if someone can only afford to buy one case of tinctures and sell it every week, literally we've had farmers every week ordering a case, which is like 24 tinctures, selling them at the market to get money, call me the next week, order one more case, sell it at the market, do it. And, and really that's how they were growing their business. And like one of our best accounts now is a person who started that small and uh, now they're crushing it and I'm so happy for them. And I'm happy to be working with this person, a small farm for the last two years. And, you know, because we offered that, we helped them, you know, grow that side of their business. So, um, you know, just trying to keep it so that people can get in without having, you know, crazy amounts of cash. Wow. That is honorable and it's cool to see. I, I see that you are like stuck between two worlds of like the the moral world of like doing right and then capitalism and you're like <laughs> yeah. sitting in the middle of like where do i want to live and yet you've created a, a, a successful business so like what about if that guy or that company just starts to pop off they're doing great they're taking your customers they originally had your product and now they're making their own like how, how do you feel about that and being pushed out of the market for for that handout i mean it i don't one i don't see it as a handout right to that person and if like i the the benefit of working with a lot of these smaller businesses is you really build relationships over time and i think that anyone who um tries to like cut us out after a couple of years like that's their karma that's their problem and like you know let them and honestly the market is pretty big like we're not their competition. They can go compete against Charlotte's Web or, you know, Garden of Life or whoever. And if they have that mentality, then we don't want to work with them. And I'd rather make space in my life to work with someone who like gives a shit, you know, but we definitely vet our customers and try to build those relationships as much as possible to make sure we're not working with those, you know, people with that mentality. Got it. Got it. And just to clarify, in case I uh, miss um, misconstrued something, you're obviously charging them like a wholesale rate. You're, you're charging them like a fair rate to buy products and then to go sell them at whatever. D- do you put a restriction on what price they can upcharge on them? No, we don't. No, we charge. We do charge them a fair wholesale, you know, white label um, rate and they can sell stuff for whatever they want, whatever margins they feel they, you know, they need to get. And some of our people are selling really expensive tinctures, you know, cause they're on long Island, they're in the Hamptons or whatever. And, you know, if they can get 70 bucks for something that I can only get 40 bucks for here in Cortland, good. You know, that's, that's fine by me. I have no, you know, hate or negativity towards that. Um, the market is what the, what the market is, you know? So as long as they keep coming back to us and keep buying from us and, and we keep working together, I'm cool with that. Right on, right on. Okay. Um, you, you're creating the ecosystem and and continuing to, to, um, give back to it. That's how the ecosystem works, right? (laughs) Totally. Yeah. Um, all right. Last thing I'm going to say on the hemp front, uh, the business of e-com. That is probably a farmer's worst nightmare at first yeah. is trying to like come to the computer and now try to like make these online sales. Uh, talk to me about any of the tricks to the trade you guys have learned from farm to computer screen and then through distribution. Okay. So luckily my business partner, Carly, she takes care of all the e-commerce stuff. She is a e-commerce genius you know she's self-taught learned herself and um she definitely is really good at that side as people know the hardest part about cbd and e-commerce is you can't do advertising or, or, or marketing on facebook or whatever traditional you know ad spend so we've had to build we've had to build um our customer base organically no pun intended uh you know we we like because we sell at farmers markets, people find us there, they find us at Wegmans and then they make their way to our website. COVID like sped up that e-commerce 
growth so fast. I mean, retail took a took a took a a big hit, and a lot of our customers switched to e-commerce, which is totally fine, you know. And um, we have Facebook groups, you know. We we try to be at the farmers market, you know. We care about the people who buy from us, and we've tried to show that care and love for our customers online. And mostly that comes through Facebook groups. We have amazing Facebook lives every month, a lot of educational programming. We do farm tours all the time. So, you know, we're trying to have that personal connection with our customers, even though they're on e-commerce, try to bring them into real life connection, whether it's Facebook or in person. And, and, I know this isn't the part that you run. This is Carly's jam, but do you know what tools you guys are using? Yeah. So we are running our website now off of Shopify. Um, we're using, a, you know, we've been through so many credit card processors. I don't know the name of this one, but we have a really good credit card processor right now. That's, you know, we've used the same one for over a year, year and a half, which is a pretty good run in the CBD world. Yeah. And also, um, you know, we've been kicked out of banks, of course, like every other hemp cannabis company has. Luckily, we have a, a local credit union here and the credit union has taken us on over the last couple of years. Again, a lot of what we do is relationship based and I built a great relationship with the credit union and their CEO and they've been out to the farm. Their whole team has been here, their compliance team, looking at our facilities, looking at the farm, making sure we are like, you know, doing everything by the book, high quality. And um, thank God for them because they do all of our banking. They took care of all those PPP loans during COVID, the EIDL loans. Um, they're amazing. And the better part, now that we've built such a great relationship with them and there's been no like horrible, you know, money laundering type thing, which is what they're always worried about working with the cannabis uh, business is that they've given us the green light to bank with them uh, for THC. So as soon as, you know, we go legal next year, they are right there with us, willing to do our banking for us. And I'm very excited about that because I know how difficult that is. And so I, I really cherish that relationship. And um, I'm so glad we found that credit union. So for anyone out there who's getting into hemp or cannabis, go find your local credit unions because they're amazing. And um, it's been really good. Yeah, credit unions are really like the underlying like rock for cannabis throughout the country. Um, I said this is my last one, but now this is my last one. How do people build relationships with the payment processors in the banks? Like, it's a very literally transactional like relationship. Mm -hmm. how, how did you build a relationship with them? Like, how did you go up like, hey, I'm gonna be honest, I have a hemp company. Do you want to see my farm? And then he's like, yeah, sure. And then, and then you guys like smoked a J and became friends or like, <laughs> you know, like how does somebody become friends with the owner of a credit union? All right. No, um, he's the owner of a credit union, but you know, the there's a, president. there's a, there's a CEO, there's a yeah. CEO of a credit union or whatever president. Um, it takes time. And yeah, I, I literally walked into the credit union and I said, Hey, my other bank, which was next door to the credit union, just kicked me out. And this is what I do. Totally legal, totally legit. I want to bank with you guys. I want to show you the farm. I want to show you a processing facility. Um, and I want to talk to you about this and tell me if it's something you're interested in. And they were like, sure. Yeah. You know, I talked to the branch manager. They kicked me up to the, you know, they go up the ladder and they started visiting their farm, their lawyers. You know, I, I, I provided them a lot of legal resource uh, resources through the State Department of Agriculture here in New York that everything we were doing was legit, got them comfortable, got their compliance team comfortable, showed them like the test results, um, also guaranteed them that we wouldn't be depositing that much cash. And that was a big one here because their biggest fear on compliance is cash, a lot of cash, because then they're worried about laundering money and all that other stuff. And, you know, luckily for us, we can do, we're a lot e-commerce, a lot of checks. And so we're not a cash business in the CBD world. And so because it's not cash, um, they got very comfortable with us and just being super transparent, honestly, we were like opened up everything to them, our books, our facilities, anything they wanted to see, we let them and they did. They looked through all of our books. They looked through our tax returns, everything. I mean, they did their due diligence. So that's the other thing here 
going that route is that you do have to be transparent and be legit and, you know, kind of prove, you do have to prove yourself a little bit. Um, also, it didn't hurt that at that time, uh, we were, when we were having issues with hemp banking, we got Senator Schumer to come out to our farm and do a press conference and write a letter to the, you know, banking regulators, the federal government banking letters in 2019, saying to clear up banking for hemp companies specifically. And it worked and they did. And so that also provided a lot of like legitimacy to like the bank. They're like, oh, Alan's got Chuck Schumer at the farm talking about hemp banking. Like, oh crap, like this is actually legit. <laughs> so let's, let's do this. So, um, you know, that's the, I guess the benefit of all me spending all these years doing, you know, advocacy work is it also provided that extra level um, of, of legitimacy. I just wanted to say, like, you said one term that is just like so important in the cannabis industry that people don't ever talk about, which is the transparency. So, and this is like when we connected through our buddy Ross, you know, he was like, you got to meet my, my, my guy, Alan. And, you know, and, and we're so sometimes jaded in New York where it was just like, all of a sudden now everyone's coming out of the woodwork saying they were part of the MRTA they were creating all these laws and I was like, what is going on here? But what was really cool when we first had our initial conversation, you know, you had all of these like plaques behind you of like, you know, you were getting um, certification. I don't know what you call them. Like, I don't yeah, want to see you want to, you want to see, you want to see. Yeah. One? <laughs> yeah. So what you get when, when you help work on a bill, and I have two, I have one for hemp, and then I have one for the, the MRTA. So you get one of these things. And this is a signed copy by the governor. This is signed by Governor Cuomo. And you get this like bill copy that is signed that you were like involved, uh, involved in that creation and passage of that bill. And so I have one for the MRTA and then I have one for the hemp bill that we wrote and got passed in 2019. Um, how many so, people get that? How many people get that in a bill? Any idea? I, no, That's not, I don't know, 20 or so, 30 people, I, maybe not a ton. I think yeah, from living. now on, from yeah. now on, yeah. like I'm asking for yes. receipts. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, you helped with MRTA? Oh, cool. Can I see Let the receipt? See bill. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get a note from Cuomo? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That <was> it. <laughs> but that was just Dear that was, Alan. Yeah. That was, <laughs> it was awesome because, you know, like that's one of the reasons Jacoby and I started on the Revel. Cause like even what five, six years ago, there was like a conference in Jersey saying, Hey, you know, come to our conference, spend like five hundred dollars and we're gonna get you a license. And we're like, wait a minute, there wasn't even licenses back then. So <laughs> Um, so just like, just super happy we connected with you and thanks Ross and also shout out to, um, Jordan from, uh, Marino PR who yes. actually hit us up the same week that, um, <laughs> that, uh, Ross texted. So it was like, okay, this is meant to be, we're supposed to build some shit together. The universe, the universe. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to flip topics one more time. Sure. Okay. Let's talk about some weed shit. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about vegetables. We talked about hemp. That's cool. <laughs> it's all extremely important. But you did just help pass the MRTA. Actually, I shouldn't say just. This is like six months ago at this point. Uh, you know, Cuomo's dragging his feet, whatever. But we have movement now, right? We actually just had our first meeting. Yeah. I, I know this. I know you know this. But can you give me like a... 30 second status update of like where we are today in New York. What's the, what's just the latest things that have happened? Cool. So we passed the bill in March. Cuomo dragged his feet the whole time. He got kicked out of office, resigned, whatever. <clears throat> nothing happened for six months, literally nothing. A lot of talking behind the scenes. Now we have a board appointed. We have a five member uh, cannabis control board. We have an executive director, which is Chris Alexander, which Shout is amazing. Chris. Shout out to Chris. Yes. My guy. Chris, He's yes. man. Chris, Chris is amazing. We, we just spoke the other day. I told him I were doing your show. He said, I love Jacoby. Uh, and so, you know, like 
Chris is there. Thank God he's the right person for the job. And so now the next steps are to write those regulations, figure out the licensing structure, how much it's going to cost, who's going to get licensed. You know, now like the real work begins, right? I mean, it was a lot of work to get that bill passed. I shouldn't say now the real work begins, but like the bill is passed, but now it's getting licenses out to people and making sure most importantly, we follow through with the intent of the bill, which is all about craft. It's all about social equity licenses. It's all about uh, people hurt by the war on drugs and making sure they get in the industry. It's all about um, making sure the legacy people don't get left behind and they have access to licenses from the beginning. And so it's going to be a big task for Chris and the rest of the board to uh, really figure out how to roll this program out better than any state has done before, because obviously we're New Yorkers, so we got to do it best, of course. And that's, that's the task at hand. And so my job, part of my job as the president of this cannabis association is to make sure that we keep that government accountable. We keep it transparent, Lulu, like back to your point, you know, the meetings are transparent. They're open to the public. We all watched the first one that just took place and making sure that the bigger corporations are not going behind closed doors and getting their licenses and screwing everyone else. And so that's kind of what my association does. Um, the other thing that we do is we look at, we look at um, the policies, the regulations, and we say, listen, this policy is no good, here's why. And we'll write like a policy position paper, a white paper, we turn it in, like this is our official stance, consider it. Uh, these are language changes that we want to these proposed regulations. And a lot of the times they listen to us, especially in hemp and CBD. I mean, we're the first state, you know, not to go backwards here, but we're like the first state who allows CBD and food and beverages. We literally have the first law that says you can put 25 milligrams of CBD in a can of seltzer. And like, that's legal now. That was a weird time. I remember that. That was Yeah. A weird time. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we wrote that bill literally wrote wrote it and got it passed in 2019 because we saw the problems that were going on around the country the, the lack of movement on the fda side and so we have been that resource for the regulators and so they've come to trust us we're very transparent um with them like this is why we need that if you do x y and z here's how you're going to screw farmers or here's how you're going to screw small businesses so let's you know please reconsider the language you've just drafted and so now we're working on that on the thc side with the with the office of cannabis management our goals are to get as many craft licenses out there next year for spring growth as possible we're put we just had a senator put forth a bill for provisional licensing so even if the board doesn't fully have the regulations in place and the full licensing process in place, the very least we can do is like let all of these farmers and legacy cultivators plant a crop in May so that when the dispensaries open in a year from now, there's actually product on the shelves, right? And so that's been super important for our group. And that's what we've been spending a lot of time advocating for most recently. I, I want to break that part down because I think there's some, um some math kind of behind the scenes that you that you're kind of like insinuating but before i do i also want to just shout out jason star as well yes. so in their first meeting they i don't know if i have the right language elected or chose the chief equity hired. Officer. Yeah. Yeah, hired, hired hired the chief equity equity officer uh and jason star awesome pick for the job and like it just we are off to a very like, well <laughs> six months oh, sucked start. Now a very good start for like a month here. And I think while we were in that waiting period, I think you'd probably agree. The thing I was most anxious about happening is who was in these positions, right? Like I feel confident that Chris Alexander is going to make sure that the, the regulations that come out on his watch are true to the spirit of the bill. Cause a lot of times like, you could put that in the bill. We want 50% as our goal of people. But then if you put somebody in position of power to like make that come to life, that spirit is reflected. So the who, thumbs up. They got two thumbs up as far as I'm concerned. All right? Nobody really cares about my opinion, but it's out there. 
<laughs> no, we care. We care. And having your having your validation on that is actually really important, right? Because that's everyone's fear, Jacoby, is that they're gonna they're gonna put someone in place that just doesn't care. And they had another candidate for Chris's job who was really close to getting that position under Governor Cuomo and he was not caring about social equity. He was not caring about craft, small farmers, et cetera. He was like, let's just throw everyone in a freaking lottery and who gives a shit who gets these licenses and let's move on and just regulate this industry to death and collect as much taxes as possible. Um, so he's not there <laughs> anymore. Um, and so, you know, Chris is now in that position, thankfully, and that is super important. And, you know, unless you're following very closely along, like the this group is, you don't, really realize how important that is but it is it's everything right now totally uh, i think there's few people following it as intensely as you i won't even pretend that i'm on that <laughs> level but i want to go back to your other point about the provisional licenses so i, I think this is a point that kind of gets missed when when we talk about opening up a completely net new industry it's not net new but um the floodgates open for the industry dispensaries will open but it takes a while to grow the products that go on those shelves. We're not going to go import them from other states just to you know open the doors on day one. We need to build the infrastructure to develop the, the to have the inventory. Right now, there are ten um, ROs, right, um, ten medical facilities that are growing. Okay, nine of the ten are uh, multi-state operators. One is is just just New York. Obviously, they have the infrastructure to cultivate. They do not have nearly the infrastructure needed to cultivate all of the flour for the recreational market. And even if they did, one might assume that it'd be pretty freaking unfair for everybody else. So with that context, I think the provisional licensing is really interesting because it, it gives the opportunity to people that are like, hey, we're here. We've been doing this. State of New York, you have a shortage about to come up here. You're either going to have to delay these people that work hard to get a dispensary or give handouts to other people that already are probably going to be well capitalized and successful no matter what. Here's a third option that you guys didn't consider. Why don't you let us do what we do best and give us the benefit of the doubt that we're going to try to do this as legit as possible so that we can continue to eat in this industry. And I think that is a phenomenal step in terms of the ethos of what we want in the New York market and the MRTA and the people in charge. Now, I don't, I don't know the status of that. I think that was like a proposition. I don't think that that's a legit thing yet. Um, but I think it's one of the greatest things I've heard in a while, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. It is a really good way to approach this. And you're right. There is the existing 10 RO stands for registered organizations. They're, they're the vertically integrated medical marijuana companies. They each have three dispensaries and they can open up another three for adult use once they get the time comes for that. Some of those companies are telling the New York politicians that they are going to supply the entire market and we don't need anyone else. One of them just bought like a 35 acre greenhouse complex and, um, you know, another one is building, they're claiming a 350,000 square foot facility, etc. So that's all bullshit. You know, we all see through that. We know the products they grow and make aren't great. That's not the flower people want. They're not the brands that people want. New York has its market. I mean, we know the New York delivery services. And, um, you know, we, we need to make sure we limit their footprints, right? And so mm -hmm. one that leveling of the playing field is where that provisional licensing bill comes in that we are currently working on and getting through in, you know, through the Senate and then into, you know, it couldn't get passed until January, but we're working on it right now. And yeah, it is all about leveling that playing field, but it is also about staying true to the MRTA because the only way we stay true to the MRTA is we don't let consolidation happen for the first few years. And we let, people build out their grows we let people build out their brands we let we let people get a foot into the industry who are not that well capitalized who are not publicly traded companies let them make their mistakes we know there's going to be issues growing cannabis is not easy but 
we have faith that our existing New York people can supply the entire New York market. And that's what we need. We need to give them a chance to do so. And if three years we fail, fine, those MSOs are going to be there to take over anyway. They don't need to take over now. Yeah. Think, think about General Mills. They've been around for 110 years or I don't know if it's 110, 100 plus right. years, right? <laughs> like the first three years, we don't need to give them a free handout. Like let us at least like, stand a fighting chance before these big behemoth of you know cpg companies in the cannabis world take over um i want to pause on the the retail side of things though i could talk about this forever as you guys know and i want to ask about like the cultivate or um yeah the cultivation in the in the processors so if i have the chops to do that the money to do that or maybe i'm even doing it today and i'm in new york do you think it's wise to go get some farmland and start now? Do you think I should get my money and just wait and try to put in a very compelling application? Um, how would you approach it if you were kind of just starting today and you had all the resources, you're just trying to make the right decision? Yeah, that's a tough one because we just don't know how that licensing for cultivation rolls out. I know they're going to you know, we have all these existing hemp farmers, right? They know how to grow feminized flour. They have greenhouses, you know, it's done at scale. They're pretty good at it. We have curing, we have drying. So we need those people to get licensed for the supply chain purposes. You know, then you have the legacy cultivators. We need them to get licensed because they might already be doing those indoor grows. But then there's the third category of social equity licenses and new small businesses, right? We can't leave them out from day one. And, you know, Jacoby, we're trying to figure that part out right now is how do we have that third column, let's say, for people who just want to get started. Um, we don't have answers to it yet, but we know we have to have it there and we have to set aside licenses for those people to, to do that. I don't know what that's going to look like, but, you know, me and you do know and, you know, Lulu knows and we've all been to a lot of grows all over the place, I'm sure, is that even if you go out and buy farmland, right now, but you don't have any experience as a cult, as a true cultivator, your first year is going to be rough. You know, we can't rely on those people as part of the main supply chain for all of our dispensaries, because there's a good chance, even well capitalized and well resourced, and people don't love hearing this, but their first year is going to be a bust. I mean, I saw hemp farmers grow 10 acres of hemp and not harvest like a freaking pound, you know? And so that's just the reality. And that's why those incubator programs are so important, especially for the first year people, because you got to learn how to grow. And um, it's an art form. And I hate that a lot of times, especially in farming, like vegetable farming, people are like, they think it's easy, right? They think it's an unskilled labor. They think it's easy. They think they're just going to throw some seeds in the ground and just get it done. We all know that's not how you grow high quality cannabis. Like mm -hmm. it is a... And it maybe is the ROs, maybe the ROs, there needs to be provision for them to do an incubator and have a certain amount of cohorts to have them go through that process. I don't know. They are push they are pushing the ROs are pushing for their own incubator programs, but we're also working with multiple other incubator programs who are not run by ROs around the state to help people in in this transition. Um Again, I wish I had all the answers. I definitely don't, um, but we know it needs to happen, and we're trying to figure that out. So I've I've seen a couple people play this this move, which I'm not advocating or saying not to do it. They're just like, you know what? I'm going to become an underground operator today. Yeah. They say they want to include legacy operators. You know what? Let me set up shop now. And to your point, if you're going to take an L on that first harvest and you're not going to get criminalized for it, go get those reps in. You can learn now. And then you're positioned later to say like, look, I've already been doing this. Now, like I said, I'm not advocating for it, but I have seen that move happen, which I, I mean, I'm not mad at that, right? Like I hope, you know, I want everybody to do things a smart way, but like, it's not a terrible idea. No, I'm not mad about that either. But when they go to give out those licenses, and I was just on a call with a, uh, a group from California that is a nonprofit that works on licensing and stuff for social equity applicants, trying to understand the more nuanced part of that conversation, Jacoby, is that how do you prove you're a legacy 
grower and a legacy operator. And some of the people I'm speaking to in New York City right now who are running sizable um, delivery services, 2,000, 4,000 pounds a month, like sizable delivery services are like, yeah, well, if I go tell them what I'm doing, am I just going to go to jail? You know? And so uh, there is that question. So when we talk about the legacy growers, we, we need a system in place where you prove you've had maybe I have X amount of harvest. I, I can't wait to hear it. But like, that's what the regulators are asking for. And you know, Chris Alexander is asking us right now for that information. What's the criteria of the legacy operators? Are we looking at their cash app? Are we looking at, you know, pictures? Are we looking at their genetics? Like, what are we really looking at here to know that these are the real legit people who we want as part of our industry? Here's, here's the solution. How many times has your Facebook or Instagram been shut down? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We can ask Zuckerberg, like, look, dude, you're going through enough shit. Why don't you just show us all the accounts that you shut down so that we can validate these people have been selling weed? That's oh, it, man. right there. <laughs> That's a good one. No, that's totally a good one. Um, yeah, something it's going to have to be something like that. And it's going to have to be creative. And we're going to have to have guarantees and assurances that when you come out and you're like, I'm moving, you know, whatever it is, two cases a month, I'm not going to jail immediately. You know, like right. that's, that's the tricky part. And there's a lot of trust there. And part of what my association is doing in group with groups in New York City, Harlem Business Alliance, and a couple other ones is trying to make it comfortable for people that are going to come out and, and be safe to say, I'm an operator, like I want to be licensed, help, because I might know how to run my delivery service, but I don't know how to do compliance and pay taxes and payroll and unemployment insurance and like all this stuff that I got to learn. I need help, you know? So people are going to have to trust a little bit some I'm, along this line on that, on that front. I have a question. So amnesty is being talked about, right? So um, is there like a process that's going to happen for that? Like, is there going to be like some type of legal waiver that's going to be presented <laughs> to you to come out? Um, so is there any conversations about that? I, I we are having rudimentary conversations, Lulu. I don't know how that looks. I'm not a lawyer, and I definitely don't want to be the person to make a decision on that. And I do not envy Chris Alexander and Jason Starr right now uh, because they're going to have to make that decision. Those are the those are the people, and we have to trust that they're going to do it right and safe for an amnesty type situation, a waiver. I don't know. Um, but that's definitely top of mind of how that could happen. Yeah. I'm super excited. I'm just, I'm super excited that all of these other states have been talking about things and we have these words, social equity, we have like the war on drugs. And it's just nice that at least on paper, New York is, um, has it written down and that we have people in place, um, including yourself that are going to be pushing for small business. that are going to be pushing for an equitable industry. They're going to be pushing for, having any everybody have these opportunities and not just like Florida and Nevada. So um, super stoked. And should I transition a little bit now to what we're doing in November together as Let's a do it, Lulu. Let's do it. So everyone proud to announce that on November 13th on the Revel, along with the New York Cannabis Growers and Processors Association, 0.7 group in Canaclusa, we are hosting our first in-person event. Um, uh, licensing in New York City, or oh, sorry, New York State hosted in New York City. Woo! And, um, you know, the thing that we love to do at On the Revel is always present actionable things. So this is not going to be a conference where we're bringing the biggest people in to talk about how exciting the industry is. This is going to be uh, a conference where if there's anything that you've ever wanted to know about getting a license in New York, we have the right speakers, we have the right people here to give you that information so you can make a um, well, uh, well uh, and robust decision if getting a license is right for you, um, whether you're legacy, whether you're just starting, whether you're you know already in another state, um, this is going to be super dope. Um, and the other part that we're really excited about is we're going to be hosting a legacy mixer, um, getting the folks in legacy, getting the regulators in the room together 
to actually meet as human beings um, instead of sitting behind closed doors, actually understanding um, the folks that you're trying to create loss for. So um, this is going to be exciting. And we just got in and secured, right, Jacoby? We got the contract signed on, on a really amazing spot in West Village. So more of that will be released um, this next week. So yeah, keep your eyes out. Yeah, facts. Thank you. Thank you, Lulu, for bringing that up. Uh, I want to just add to it. The reason we're doing this is Lulu, myself, Peter, uh, we felt that we were uniquely positioned because we have friends in the underground and relationships with the legacy game that have been operating. We've been reaching out and helping groups kind of pro bono just to say, hey, this is what I know. This is what I think. Here's some game we can show you. But we also know that Lulu and myself came from the West Coast and we have relationships with people that are operators that are service providers in other markets. And we believe that On The Revel is uniquely positioned to merge some of these groups. And with great people like Chris Alexander, Jason Starr, people we, we've met and have relationships with, in fact, I'd call both of them homies, You know, we can bring government into here and, and have real candid conversations because like you'd mentioned, Alan, it's very tough to go from the underground, you're making good money, you're solid there, and trust right that you're going to be okay if you come clean about this and that you're going to have like a fair chance of operating. So, you know, we we felt we were in a position that we can be that catalyst to bring in the service providers, we can bring in the the experts from other markets, we can bring in government and we can also bring in the the legacy operators to have candid conversations and make this happen. So, this conference is going to be dope. We are starting from the beginning, soup to nuts, everything you need to know and that we know so far about licensing in New York. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, every state is, is different, but the 70% upfront is all the same, right? You need your operating agreement. You're going to need to figure out real estate. The intricacies of, of that real estate will come out in the regs, but you got to start to build your team properly. You got to start to fundraise. You got to start to think about your product SKUs, your partnerships, all of that. So we're breaking it down. November 13th, it's happening. Alan has been gracious enough to connect with us and help partner on making this happen. Can Occlusive, our homies are helping us here. 0.7, they've won over 80 plus licenses for their partners throughout the country. They're coming to make sure that we're talking facts the whole time. It's going to be a vibe, man. It's going to be a good one. Super excited. I'm so excited about the event. I've been telling a lot of people. Don't That's worry. Cool. I've already I, I've already been inviting uh, Chris Alexander to it multiple times. I was like, if you're going to make a public debut, this is the event to make Revelry, that public baby. debut. That's right. Absolutely. So it's yeah, it's going to be amazing. Hell yeah. All right, guys. Uh, Peter has been excited on the sidelines and his Wi-Fi is trash. So I'm going to give him one third strike to make an appearance here and say how excited he is. And if he freezes, we're kicking him off again. Yo, hopefully it doesn't happen. Uh, I just want to say to everyone, um, this is literally going to be the event to come. If you've ever sat around your smoke circle and talked about, yo, they're just going to give these to the rich folk. Um, and they're going to take over. This is your chance to make sure that doesn't happen. We're going to walk through everything. The people that you need to know are going to be there. We're, we're going to do this together. And, and when we say that we're a community, we're real about it. And we welcome you. Um, and I really hope some of you guys hear that um, and come through. I didn't wow. Peter's the spirit, the spirit of, of our, our group. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. For sure. It's very normal. <laughs> all right guys revelry november 13th tickets coming out soon check the email list if you're not on our email list you better get on it um or any of our partners so the new york cannabis growers and processors association can occlusive or 0.7 all of them will be blasting this out shortly uh we're excited for it and uh let's wrap up this episode alan dude it's a pleasure man like honestly we, we met you a couple months ago and it's been like Nothing but love. We appreciate cool. it. This is a great episode breaking down what's what's really going on here. And really quick, yeah. Alan, how do how do our, our folks get in touch with your products yep. and tell us how we can get to you? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. You can go to floristfarms.com uh, or headandheal.com. We'll make discount codes for like 50% off for both those websites. Whoa, you know, we'll, for, all, for, for all your, yeah, totally. We just want people to try the stuff, the tinctures, hemp flower, whatever they need in their life. You know, we want them to try it. The coupon code will just be dope people. Uh, Let's of go. Course. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I just want to get stuff out into the world. You know, that's what it's all about. Thank right you on. So and and, and yeah. the association, too. Yeah. And go to the association website. It's nycgpa.org. You can become a member. We have a sliding scale. Um, get on our newsletter list. We have monthly member calls. We've got a Slack channel with like 200 plus people on it with like classifieds and chat rooms and people always asking questions and super active uh, slack going on uh, over there. So definitely become a member, sign up for our newsletters. We tonight uh, at the same time as filming this, we actually have a town hall on social equity where we have multiple presenters talking about social equity, someone from the ACLU. So we're constantly doing events and farm tours, facility tours, like all of the stuff that we need. Um, to lay the groundwork for the industry. So definitely check that out as well. That's a must. That's a must. And I think we need a Revel field trip to your farm. Amen. Yes. That <laughs> Absolutely. We're working on that right now. <laughs> Let's go. All right, guys. Well, thank you to everybody that tuned in on YouTube, on the podcast. Um, thank you so much to Alan. You are a fine gentleman and a scholar, sir. We really appreciate you being here and, and preaching the good word of cannabis in New York. Peace, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys.